Hello and welcome to today's financial planning webinar on intergenerational wealth transfer. My name is Scott Evans and I'm a senior financial advisor at Blue Shore Financial. Joining me today is Rutsu Shikano, an estate lawyer and partner at Richard Buell Sutton, a firm with over 150 years of history in British Columbia and one of the largest wealth protection teams in the city. As a financial advisor at Blue Shore, I work with a team of experts who specialize in areas such as portfolio management, wealth pr protection, and estate planning. Partnering with experts like Rootsu allows us to make sure we can provide up-to-date and unbiased advice for our clients. A little housekeeping before we get started. If your power goes out, as I look out the window at the swaying trees, uh, this webinar will be recorded. If you have to step away, uh, fear not, we will email out a link later on that, uh, to, the, to the recorded survey. You are in a listen-only mode, so you can hear us, but we can't hear you, we can't see you. If you do have questions, I encourage everyone uh, throughout the presentation, not just at the end, to please enter in the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen, any questions you may have. And at the end of the presentation, we'll address as many as we can. If we don't get to your questions, we will be sure to get back to you uh, with, with an answer or um, an invitation to meet to get more information. So unfortunately, if we can't get to everybody, Rest assured, your question will be responded to. Throughout the survey, we're going to have a couple of polls, so I'm encouraging everybody to be interactive and uh, click your mouse when we do have these polls come up because it'll give us some interesting topics that we can that will add to our conversation today. And at the end of the survey, or sorry, at the end of the presentation, there will be a survey as well. You'll also be emailed the survey, mm -hmm. and answering that allows us to uh, help provide. Valuable, valuable information and webinars to clients uh, in the future to find out what people are interested in and really learning more about. Our agenda today is intergenerational wealth transfer. So really this is something that um, has come to mind in the last couple of years. I'm finding clients are bringing this up a lot more is the, the rising cost of living and especially cost of housing here in the Vancouver area. People are looking to help out children, help out family more often than uh, we've ever seen as far as getting into the real estate market, helping with kids or grandkids education, different ways of helping both when they're alive now and, and in the future when they may not be here. We're gonna present to you today in a format of having a case study uh, with, a, with a family scenario that's going to address some of these topics and provide some, some thoughts, some, uh, some different ideas that you can consider that may work for your own situation, and some recommendations that um, could help you with your decisions as far as helping out family, how to save tax, how to protect your, your assets, and uh, do so efficiently and in a manner that uh, makes sure your, your wishes are all come true. Uh, we will look at goals and considerations, so addressing the family case scenario and, and touching on each of their goals and, and different options. Um, it's not a one-size-fit-all, and, and this is going to be something that we provide you some options that really you're going to want to take back and, and talk to a financial advisor, talk to an estate lawyer, talk about how this will fit into your financial plan and uh, decide on what strategies may or may not make sense for you. And as we wrap up, we will go into our Q&A session. Again, encourage you to ask any questions along the way. Starting out with what is wealth? So wealth can include our investable assets, your bank accounts, family business and holdings, real estate collections such as antiques, uh, collector cars, baseball cards, in my case, that have very little value. Uh, but that brings me to the other point is that these are also very emotional things. So we're not just looking at numbers. We're tying together emotions, family relationships, and family values, really deciding on what is important, uh, whether it's charities, different foundations that you want to support. There, there's ways to communicate these with your loved ones uh, while, while there's still time, as well as addressing them in, in your will. And, and we'll talk about different ways that those may make sense and, and even some of the tax advantages of doing so at different times. 
what is wealth transfer? Now, if this was just about numbers, I think it would be pretty easy. And it's really not. Um, emotions can run high. We talk about things like a family cottage, uh, a vacation home. Often we're looking at where it may be held with, uh, you know, a single owner now, or possibly something that's been passed down multiple generations. And there's treasured family memories and uh, you know experiences that you can't put a number on. And so having these conversations starting early to start your planning and to talk to family members to figure out what what's important to them and. Where, what they're thinking of, where their emotions are, which, which assets um, are important to them, because they may not, not always be thinking the same way that, that you are. So I encourage people to have these conversations. And one of the things we do at Blue Shore is we encourage families to come in for a family office style meeting where we can be a participant in these conversations and, and help you facilitate uh, tougher topics that may be tougher to address. Our first poll here, are you looking to pass along an inheritance or at least a portion of your estate to support your loved ones before you're gone? So I'd like to hear from the audience here. Uh, anybody who's, they've signed up for this webinar. So are you considering passing along, gifting while you're still alive for, for any reason really? A yes, no, or an unsure, please. We'll give a few seconds here to collect those answers. Polls are in, not too surprising if you're on the webinar that 65% uh, have said they are, uh, they are interested and uh, some people are unsure and a few people are not. So it's all okay. And, and part of the process that uh, we're gonna talk about today really is thinking about yourself first as far as your financial plan, your retirement plan. I always say you want to make sure that any of these goals, the estate planning process is part of the bigger financial planning process. And so finding that you do have the resources in place for your own retirement, for your own potential uh, future care costs and medical costs. And then it allows you to make a better decision as to how much you're able to help out and, and how. Now, a survey across Canada, very similar to the numbers we just had there, 65% of respondents in Canada said they were looking to pass along a gift during their lifetime. 69% in British Columbia, slightly higher, uh, probably attribute that to the higher cost of uh, housing here in Vancouver, but uh, not, not too surprising, these numbers, and sim similar to our, on, our, on our call today. When we talk about wealth transfer, I like to think of it really in three different phases, and we'll address each of those today in, this, in the case study. Now, lifetime transfers refer to while you're living. So this would be a gift that has the benefit of you seeing your kids or whoever you're wishing to gift to enjoy the benefits during your lifetime. Inter-household transfers would be on the passing of one spouse, so passing an asset from one spouse to the next. And finally, intergenerational would be on the passing of the second spouse, how assets are distributed after we're gone. Again, I, I like to encourage you to think of this less about just the numbers and more about the bigger picture of your values, what's important to you and deciding on the best way for you to make an impact with the wealth that you do have. How much to transfer, who gets what, how to decide and what is fair. There's different scenarios for every family, but it could be as simple as saying, I have three children and one of them is in a life stage now where they need help on a down payment that maybe they're starting a family and they're they're looking to get into a home but i have another child who's not how do i be fair if i help out one of them but not the other so all considerations you want to make in advance of any gifting or any transfers of assets another survey here what are your main areas of interest when it comes to interfamily gifting please select all that apply 
We've got education, first home purchase, car, living expenses, new business, vacation property. I think all of these are things I've, I've heard from clients that are interested in, in helping out family members. Definitely some come up higher than the others and we'll see our results. 100% first home purchase. We must live in Vancouver. I will say that uh, education often comes in a close second. I've seen more and more grandparents interested in helping save for grandchildren's education, which they can do through a registered education savings plan, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Now, introducing our case study, I'll pass it over to Rutsu, who's gonna run through our family scenario. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us and thanks Scott. So as mentioned, my name is Rutsu Shikano and I am an estate planning and wealth preservation lawyer. So helping clients with the legal aspects of transferring and preserving wealth is my area of expertise. So we really hope that this case family that we're about to introduce to you uh, represents sort of a typical family and that you're able to draw upon some of the similarities in your own personal lives. So here we go. Here we go. So we have Mike and Sue. They're both in their late 60s. They're married, but this is the second marriage for both of them. So they've been married for a long time though, about 25 years now. So they consider themselves a true blended family. Mike has a daughter from a previous relationship who is unfortunately now estranged from the family. And Sue has two adult children, both either married or in common law relationships and with children of their own. So Mike and Sue have positive relationships with Sue's children and Mike treats them as if they're his own and the grandchildren as well. So their assets. So they have their principal residence, you know, if it's in Vancouver, it's worth around 2.5 million. They have their cottage property on the island now worth maybe a million. Mike has a private company and that's worth about 600,000. They have their joint non-registered investments, about $2 million. Um, Sue has her own personal uh, non-registered investment worth about $250,000. And they both have their own registered retirement savings plans, TFSAs, and other registered products like that. So after some discussion, uh, we were able to determine that Mike and Sue have several goals for their estate plan. So, the first goal is to help Sue's kids with buying their first homes. Neither of Sue's kids is able to afford a home in this expensive BC real estate market and housing security is very important to Mike and Sue. Their second goal is to help support their grandchildren's education. With rising costs of education, they want to not only ensure that their grandchildren have enough money for post-secondary education, but also possibly help them with expensive extracurricular activities and maybe even private school now. Their third goal relates to the family cottage. So the cottage is a very special place for Mike and Sue. It's where their blended family really connected and became a family. So they want to ensure that it stays within their family for future generations to enjoy. Next, Sue wants to make sure her sole non-registered investment ends up with her two kids. So this was money that came from maybe her first marriage. And so she just wants to make sure that it stays within her bloodline. Mike also has a specific goal for his company and he wants to pass that on to his side of the family. And then their final goal is to minimize or avoid any estate issues that could lead to litigation after their death. So this includes the potential redistribution of their assets contrary to their intentions. Okay, our first goal is helping children with home purchases now. Well, that's clearly of interest. That was our number one poll question there. So first scenario is gifting cash for down payment. 
So in this scenario, you are gifting money that um, you likely aren't expecting back. It is a true gift. And number of things to consider when you're doing that is how much and how to decide. And part of that is looking at your own financial plan, figuring out how much can you afford to give. We don't hate to think that you uh, are giving away something that's going to be detrimental to your own retirement lifestyle or future care costs down the road. So make sure it's something that you're comfortable with and and figure out with your own values and, and what your own intentions are. Is this something that uh, really how much do you want to help out? So often involving a lender and figuring out, I, I hear from clients a lot of the time, how much can my kids afford on their own? Because I want to just help out enough to get them in, but I still want them to have a mortgage payment. I don't want to make things too easy. So these are kind of bigger conversations you can have involving a financial advisor to, to run those numbers and figure out what a reasonable uh, reasonable amount is that will get someone into the market and whether it's a, a condo or a townhouse or a, a standalone house those are all things to have conversations about and it helps to know what people qualify for uh, having these open conversations with your kids are very important make them do a little bit of work themselves figure out what they qualify on their own before they they come to the bank of mom and dad and, and have those discussions so uh, that's really on, on the gifting side uh, pros and cons on that as well, we'll discuss in a little bit, but uh, lending cash for purchase. In this case, you're actually acting as a lender yourself. So rather than gifting funds, which often a lender will require a gift letter to show that it truly is uh, meant as a gift, lending cash could be, it could be the full amount or a portion thereof, but it's money that you're actually going to ask for back at some point, uh, likely have regular payments, uh, loan payments back to mom and dad. Now, there's different ways to do this to protect yourself, including you could register a mortgage on title. So in this case, uh, you could be, you're not going to be ahead of a bank, uh, but you could be second where if in the case of something like a marital breakdown happens, you would be repaid before the uh, the asset is sold and the funds distributed. So it's a way to protect yourself um, from a scenario like that. Guarantor versus cosigner, we often get asked on the difference there. A guarantor, think of it as just guaranteeing a payment, but you're not actually um, on that loan. You're just a guarantor of payments. The cosigner, you're actually on the mortgage yourself and have the same responsibilities to pay it. So two very different things and worth discussing with your lender as well. Uh, loan repayment terms is, as we discussed, figuring out how those payments are going to work from the children that you're lending the money to and finding something that works for both of you to repay. Often we get asked uh, how much would a mortgage be and they come up with a number similar or slightly lower than that. There's a few other law, uh, family law considerations that Rootsu is going to touch on here. Yes, so whichever you really decide to gift or to loan money to your kids, consider the stability of your child's marriage or relationship and the possible family law implications. Um, so say Mike and Sue decide to gift a chunk of cash to Sue's child towards the, towards the home purchase. They need to decide whether they will gift that cash to Sue's child only or will they gift that cash to the child and their spouse jointly? Unless you actually want to give away 50% of your gifted amount to your child's spouse in the event they separate, I suggest you gift the cash only to your child. Now, make sure you document that gift, that it's a gift to just your child only. Intention is critical here. Have the child's spouse acknowledge that the gift is being made and that it will be used towards the down payment for the family home. Also make sure that your child deposits the gift into their own bank account and not a joint account with their spouse. Once that money is commingled with joint assets, it could be argued that the child gifted that money to their spouse. So keeping records and being able to trace the money that it came from you to your child to directly pay for the purchase price, that's all crucial. Documenting and tracing is key to ensuring that the money can come back to your child in the event that they separate. Oops. 
So a third option for uh, helping your children with home purchases is to actually buy the home with them and co-own it together. I find that this arrangement works especially well for multi-generational households where you might find mom and dad live in one suite in the house and then the child and their young family lives in a secondary suite. It also works if you want to ensure that your hard earned money actually keeps working for you as it will be an investment into real estate. So if Mike and Sue decide that co-owning a property with Sue's child is the best option for them, then I would suggest that Mike and Sue determine how much they want to invest and take ownership of an undivided interest equal in proportion to their investment. So if they are going to buy in for 50% of the purchase price, then they would take an undivided 50% interest in the house. Sue's child and their spouse would then buy in for the other undivided 50% interest. So it's also important that you understand the difference here between owning a property jointly versus owning it as tenants in common. So owning an undivided 50% interest is different from owning property as joint tenants. If you own as joint tenants, on your death, your interest flows to the surviving joint owner by right of survivorship. But if you own an undivided interest as a tenant in common, then your interest flows to your estate on your death. Now, before buying together, I would sit down with the child and decide what everyone's rights and obligations are going to be with respect to that property. I would use something called a co-ownership agreement to document this. It will address things like who's going to live there, who's responsible for the physical maintenance and upkeep, who's responsible for paying the expenses connected to the property, maintenance costs, property taxes, utility bills, occupancy related costs. Now, what if a co-owner wants to sell? Could they force a sale? Do the other co-owners have a right to buy them out? But what will that price be? Is it going to be fair market value or something less than? And if that house is sold, um, how will the proceeds be divided amongst all the co-owners? And then also what happens if a co-owner gets divorced or dies or becomes incapacitated? Does that trigger a buyout? So these are just some of the typical points that we would address in a co-ownership agreement. Thanks, Ruth, too. Something I'm hearing more and more about when it comes to recreational or vacation properties as well is how to structure, uh, whether it's multiple owners under tenants in common or including a uh, uh, co-owners agreement as well, something that I didn't hear about as much, but it's becoming a lot more, more important and relevant these days. So something to consider if you haven't thought of that already. Uh, goal number two is helping grandchildren with education costs. Uh, as I touched on earlier, the cost of education, um, much like the cost of real estate, keeps going up. And I often hear from grandparents in particular that they would like a way to help out their grandkids. And in the past, we've often seen gifts being given to the, the parents who can then use it for education savings or contribute to the RESP. But starting to see more often the strategy of having the grandparent actually own the RESP themselves. Now, the RESP provides a matching grant up to a maximum on contributions that the kids can use for their schooling. Advantages are that the grant and any interest earned or income accrued is taxed in the hands of the child, not the contributor. And in the case where the grandparent opens it in their own name, they get to keep control of that asset, which often is important. Um, they're a little bit more involved. Uh, they get to make the investment decision, what it's invested in, and as well be involved when when their grandchildren grandchildren are going to school and able to to help them out with those funds. So something, if you haven't thought of, um, a good way to help grandkids with education and, and really make a difference uh, in what is challenging times to pay for for education. Uh, a couple other strategies here, Ruth, who's going to touch on as well. Thanks, Scott. So another option for funding education is the prescribed rate loan. It's not as attractive now because the prescribed rate has gone up, but it is still a viable option. Um, so remember that Mike and Sue, they have a non-registered investment of about $2 million. 
So whatever income that they're earning on that $2 million right now, they're paying tax on personally at their marginal tax rates. So they could gift after-tax money to their children to help with the grandkids' cost of education and activities, but that wouldn't be very tax efficient. So our federal government makes income splitting and shifting income to lower tax earner or lower earners hard to do. There's all sorts of rules um, in place to prevent it and at least make it very tax inefficient to do. So one way that income splitting is permitted is by way of a prescribed rate, rate loan. Mike and Sue could do this, um, for example, by taking a million dollars out of their non-registered investments, and then they would lend that across to a family trust that they create for the benefit of their grandkids. The family trust then takes that million and invests it. It will have to pay Mike and Sue the federal prescribed rate of interest annually, and that's currently 3%. Any balance of income earned on that million can then be distributed to the minor grandchildren. The result is that grandchildren pay income tax on the amount distributed to them at their much lower marginal tax rate. So since those grandchildren are still minors and not working yet, maybe about $10,000 per year can go out tax-free to each grandchild. So this kind of structure allows Mike and Sue to shift the income to their grandkids at a lower tax rate, and that saves the whole family unit tax dollars overall. So it's important though that income splitting like this only works if you receive the prescribed rate of interest annually, and otherwise um, something called attribution kicks in. So these are negative tax consequences if you don't do it properly. So if you are interested, um, I encourage you to talk to your financial advisor or accountant or lawyer about it. Now, maybe Mike and Sue, they just aren't quite ready to shift the in that kind of income over to their grandkids just yet, but they want to make sure that after they're both gone, that the grandkids have, or the kids have tools in place to be able to income split with their own children using their inheritances. So a testamentary trust is an ideal tool for this. It's a trust that takes effect after you pass away and it's set up right in your wills. It can be discretionary, meaning that the trustee of that trust can pay varying amounts to one or more of the beneficiaries as and when they see fit. So by leaving an inheritance to your children via a testamentary trust, each child can decide how their inheritance will be invested within that trust and then distribute the income and other amounts to themselves and to their own children, including minor children, as and when they decide. So this essentially creates the same income splitting benefits as the prescribed rate loan we just talked about, um, but without the need to actually lend any money or pay that prescribed rate of interest. Uh, before we move on here, I just wanted to throw out there one other uh, RESP, and this one's a mouthful. It's called the BCTESG. If you know any children, uh, family members, or grandchildren that are between the ages of six and nine, this is actually a BC grant rather than a federal grant that doesn't require any contributions, and essentially the BC government will chip in $1,200 to their educational savings plan. So again, no contribution required. Uh, but the restriction is it has to be once the child turns six and before they turn nine. So something to consider. It's not something we hear a lot about, but uh, important to take advantage of that where you can. Goal number three, oh, and before we move on along here as well, we're having a lot of questions come in through the Q&A chat. So I just want to encourage anyone else to please uh, ask questions as we go along here. And if we don't get to them all, because we've had quite a few, we will respond after the session uh, or if it's more uh, complicated, we may not answer it and we will get back to you though. Um, so rest assured your question, question will be answered. Keeping the cottage in the family, this is one of the more uh, emotional topics that we come across and a lot of people asking for advice. You know, cherished family memories, summers spent at the lake. Um, this is something that way bigger than the numbers 
is how do we keep the cottage and the family? How do we do it that keeps everybody happy, that doesn't cost us you know, more in taxes? Um, we're gonna talk about this a little bit and uh, some of the considerations here. Now, setting up as an inheritance, your, uh, you'd be looking at probate fees, property transfer tax, capital gains tax. There, there's different scenarios here and different, uh, different ways to address this. And one of the ways uh, that I always recommend looking at if you are still young enough is there's gonna be an accumulated tax liability on a family vacation property. And you can either look at it to say, well, I can save up a separate account to pay those taxes down the road. Or you could use a permanent life insurance policy that will essentially allow you to save now, contributing to a policy over a limited number of years that'll eventually generate enough to pay the future taxes so that your heirs won't have to worry about it and that uh, tax liability is, is taken care of on your passing and allows you then to uh, take away that added complication of taxes to passing along the family vacation property. Roots is gonna to touch on some of the more uh, legal considerations as well when it comes to uh, recreational properties. Yes, so leaving the cottage as an inheritance. So Mike and Sue first really need to decide which family members do they wanna leave that cottage to? Um, just Sue's kids or all three of them? And how do they intend for the kids to own it together jointly or as tenants in common? And we talked about the difference in those. Um, what if only one child actually uses that cottage and likes it? So maybe they leave the cottage to just that one child in the wills. Or maybe they give that child the right to purchase the cottage from their estate. So there's all sorts of ways you can structure leaving an inheritance, leaving a cottage or any other property as an inheritance. Now, if they don't give specific instructions um, in their wills for that cottage, it simply falls into the residue of their estate for the residual beneficiaries. So the executors at that point will really have to decide how to deal with it. Do they sell the cottage and just distribute the cash? Do they allocate the cottage to one of the, one of the residual beneficiaries? Um, do they distribute the cottage to all of the residual beneficiaries, beneficiaries equally? It's really ultimately up to the executor to decide unless you give them some guidance on that. So as Scott already mentioned, there are various taxes that will also come into play and need to be considered. Um, so the first tax we need to consider when leaving an asset as an inheritance is probate tax. So they don't call it probate tax in BC, they call it probate fees, um, but it really is essentially a tax. BC has one of the highest probate tax rates in Canada at approximately 1.4% on the fair market value of your assets on death. Now 1.4% might not seem like a big number, but it does easily add up. And this is a tax payable to the BC government in order to get the grant of probate required for your estate. A grant of probate is the court process whereby the court confirms your will. And it's during this process that the executor has to disclose what all of your assets were, the fair market value, and then pay the corresponding probate tax. So this is one of those only taxes in life that you can actually avoid or minimize fairly easily um, with some planning and some careful structuring of your assets. Um, so if Mike and Sue did absolutely nothing right now and to try to minimize the probate tax um, on a $1 million dollar cottage, if they died tomorrow, the probate tax would be about $14,000 payable to the BC government. Property transfer tax is another one. So it's payable whenever real estate changes hands in BC. And it's calculated based on the fair market value of the property at 1% on the first 200,000, 2% on the next 2 million, and then 3% on any amounts over 2 million. 
So there are some exemptions to property transfer tax, but transfers of recreational properties like the cottage are only exempt in very limited circumstances. And I can tell you that right now, this cottage at a million dollars would not be exempt. So once that cottage is in the estate of the last of Mike and Sue to die, in order to get it into the hands of the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries would have to pay about $18,000 based on today's values in property transfer tax. And the third tax to consider is capital gains tax. So in Canada, when you pass away, you're deemed to have sold all of your assets at fair market value, and then your estate has to pay the corresponding capital gains taxes. So between spouses, if you leave something to your spouse on death, there is a spousal rollover to defer this capital gains tax until the death of your spouse. On the death of the last of Mike and Sue, capital gains taxes will be payable on the full fair market value of the cottage at that time. And then the beneficiaries will receive the cottage at the cost base equal to the fair market value. So if they would rather transfer the cottage now instead of waiting until they've passed away, Mike and Sue um, should um, although, so doing this would actually avoid the probate tax um, payable on their debt, but it could trigger the capital gains tax now, and it could trigger the property transfer tax now, depending on how they actually structure the transfer. So again, before they do this, they should really make some decisions on how they're going to own that cottage with the kids. Um, will they all own as joint tenants and have that right of survivorship? Or will they all own their own undivided interest that they can do whatever they want with when they pass away? Um, another thing is, will they all be on title um, as owners? Or will they use some sort of other entity, um, like a company or trust, to own the title? And a co-ownership agreement, again, becomes very valuable. So in addition to all of the um, considerations that we pointed out earlier, things for a cottage to consider are, you know, who can use the cottage? So having a usage schedule will be important. Um, are guests and visitors permitted? Can you Airbnb or rent the cottage out? And if you can, how do you split that rental income? Now, clients often come to me and ask whether a company or a trust can own their family cottage. And my short answer is yes, but don't. So I won't go into the details as it's fairly complex, but if you are considering it, make sure you get good tax and legal advice. There are many tax traps when it comes to owning personal use property in a company or trust, and it's just usually much more simple and actually better to own it personally. I will say though, it's sometimes beneficial to set up a nominee company to own legal title to the cottage, um, just to avoid having so many people own, uh, owners listed and to avoid having to pay that property transfer tax every time ownership changes as it goes down the generations. Now the next two slides, I'll just kind of skim over because it just lists out some recent changes um, to taxation of real estate in BC and the disclosure requirements when it comes to owning uh, real estate in BC. So over the last five years or so, there's just been a lot of change. Owning recreational and investment properties in BC has become much more expensive and more onerous. So there's now a big push for transparency and disclosure about who owns property in BC. Um, and there's another big change to foreign ownership. If you or any of your beneficiaries become or are already non-residents of Canada or not Canadian citizens or permanent residents, then these changes will really affect you and your planning. Um, so it's important to just have your planning reviewed every few years. Um, otherwise, you may face some unintended tax consequences. Thanks, Rutu, and I encourage everyone to have conversations um, before you go too far down the planning road with, with your children, those potential beneficiaries. I have had scenarios where 
people were surprised when it came to the family cottage that uh, children that they thought were interested said, you know what, I, I, I really don't think I would use it or, or I'm not interested. So having those conversations to find out exactly which children are interested so you can work out some plans that uh, accommodate everyone, it, whether it makes sense to pass it down at all or, or sell it while you're alive. Now, gifting to specific beneficiaries, here we talk about a couple different things such as um, registered beneficiaries uh, on plans such as a tax-free savings account or an RSP RIF. Those can't be held joint, but you can have a beneficiary on there. And, and remember that a spouse actually has an advantage as far as a spousal rollover feature on those, especially with a tax-free savings account where they actually can inherit your room if you've maxed out your tax-free savings account. Whereas if you gift it to someone else, a child, they will receive the funds tax-free, but they don't get the room along with it. Jo adding someone joint on an account, we often get this request. Uh, it's a quick and easy way to make sure that assets go around probate, that don't go through the will. Joint with rights of survivorship, it automatically would transfer to the surviving owner. But there are some risks involved with that, and Ruth is going to touch on some of those risks. Yes. So... Historically, you know, putting assets into joint names with another person was easy and efficient, just like Scott said, it avoided probate. Um, but really, this just isn't the case anymore. Um, about 10 years ago, the law in Canada shifted. The Supreme Court has now established that when you put another person other than your spouse on, as an, on an asset as a joint owner, that person is presumed to hold that asset for you and your estate in trust. So we call this the presumption of resulting trust. So here Sue wants to make sure her sole account, investment account goes to her kids. So she might consider putting them on the account as joint owners. And most would expect that that account would then flow to her kids on her death by right of survivorship. But now under the current law, unless Sue really documents her clear intentions to that effect, her kids are presumed to hold that account for Sue's estate on Sue's death, and that account will be distributed according to Sue's will. So if her will leaves everything to Mike, her kids might not actually end up with the money in that account. Now you'll see that a common theme in estate planning is documenting your intentions. If you intend for your kids to receive the right of survivorship mm -hmm. in that account, or that piece of real estate on your death, you need to put those intentions in writing. Otherwise, the asset might flow somewhere else. So um, I'll also mention here that the government is pushing for more transparency and disclosure of information when it comes to owning bank accounts as joint owners. They want to know whose money it really is. Um, so we can expect to see some sort of ownership register or disclosure requirements coming up in the near future for those kinds of accounts. Now instead, um, Sue could achieve her goal of leaving that account to her kids by specifying in her will that the account goes to her kids. So this is much more simple, but it does mean that the kids won't have access to the money in that account until that grant of probate is obtained. So probate can take you know, minimum of six months to more commonly 18 months or 24 months to obtain. So there's going to be a long delay before the kids can actually make use of that money. Um, the account will also be at risk of potential wills variation challenges, uh, which we'll discuss in a bit as well. Just going to speed up a bit. So transferring um, Mike's business to his next generation. So business succession planning is a complex and tax driven Plan. So it's best reserved for a separate seminar, um, so we won't cover it today, but I'll just say that there are certain tax planning strategies that Mike can utilize in order to shift um, his business, the value of his business, to his next generation. Goal number six, protecting against conflict. Now, nobody wants to leave a, a mess or you know, damage family relationships through generational transfers. So uh, protecting your asset, but also protecting our relationships is uh, really an important goal of a lot of clients. 
Yes, so you'll recall here that um, Mike and Sue are estranged from Mike's daughter. So as a lawyer, whenever I hear that, you know, there's an estranged child or the client wants to leave um, inheritances unequally amongst the children, my brain just goes off Will's variation. So what is Will's variation? It is the ability under BC's law to challenge the distribution scheme that you have very carefully decided on in your will. And then the court will either redistribute your assets in a way that they feel is more fair and equitable. So who has the right to challenge your will? Your spouse and your children, including adult independent children, have the right to challenge your will after your death. And note here that stepchildren are not included. So in Mike's case, Sue and his estranged daughter have the right to challenge his will. And in Sue's case, um, Mike and her two children have the right to challenge her will. So Mike's daughter cannot challenge Sue's will and Sue's children cannot challenge Mike's will. Now, if Mike told me that he plans to cut his daughter out of his will entirely, we can be almost certain that his daughter will challenge his will on his death and seek to have the court redistribute some assets in her favor. Um, but also consider maybe Sue's children here. So a common distribution scheme that I would see is that spouses leave everything to each other. And then on the death of the second of them, that's when they leave everything to the kids equally. So if Sue dies first and leaves everything to Mike, her children have to wait until Mike has died to receive their inheritance. Now, what if Mike is a spendthrift and uses all the assets during his lifetime? Or what if he gets remarried and gives everything to his new wife in a new will? So essentially that would cut uh, Sue's kids out. Sue's kids, being Mike's stepchildren, would not have a right to challenge Mike's will at that point. Their only right is to challenge Sue's will. So they might actually consider challenging Sue's will if she dies first, just so that they can guarantee that something will come to them. So how can we avoid it? Um, we've already talked about putting assets into joint names. So if that's documented correctly, um, that is a good tool. Um, another good tool is using the beneficiary designations on registered products that Scott already mentioned. Um, but I will mention here that um, there has been recent cases in BC where the courts have actually said the resulting trust uh, principle applies here as well. So, so consider a scenario where maybe you have multiple children, but you only name one child as the beneficiary of your RRSP. Well, you know, unless the child can prove that that was your intention, that you intended to give them the proceeds of that account, a resulting trust is presumed. So documenting your intentions in those cases is going to be really important. And then life insurance as well is a good tool to help mitigate risks. So um, in these blended family situations, we'll often discuss the use of life insurance where maybe the biological parent might decide to name their child as the beneficiary instead of their spouse. Um, so here Sue could name her two kids as the beneficiary on her life insurance. And that way it guarantees that her kids get something if they pass away and that will reduce the risk of wills variation. And the last tool I'll mention is for those of you 65 years of age and over, there are things called a, an alter ego trust and a joint partner trust that you can create during your lifetime. So these trusts will act as a will substitute. It makes the need for a will, um, it just removes the need for a will. So it takes your assets out of your estate, out of your personal hands and puts them into a trust. Um, so if Mike is intending to cut his daughter out entirely, then I would recommend to him that he considers one of these trusts. That way his um, estate will be distributed according to the terms in the trust, the way he wants it to be, rather than going through a will. Thanks, Rutu. And now wrapping things up, I, I think we've shown here, Mike and Sue have some complex issues that they and goals that they want to resolve and have some answers on and i really encourage anyone out there who identifies with any of these issues to reach out to a certified financial planner reach out to an estate lawyer and start these conversations now 
the longer you wait, it doesn't get easier. So the sooner you start, you can incorporate these into your financial planning and come up with some ideas that work in conjunction with your financial plan and your retirement plan to make sure your state wishes uh, come true and are handled in a way that you'd like. Now, as we go here, sorry, I jumped through that one. We talked about different options while you're alive, the different phases of generational gifting. While upon death, pros and cons to each, and these are conversations that are good to start with your family members, with your advisors, come up with your own list of pros and cons before moving forward. Some of the solutions are gonna be more complex, but there's actually quite a few that are actually quite simple as well. So getting some professional advice will really help you along the way. Now we're gonna wrap things up here with uh, the time that we've got left. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Please keep adding them in. And if we don't get to them, we will get back to you uh, with responses. So please feel free if you have to sign off, go ahead, but we will get back to each of you with your questions. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll now move on to the Q&A period. First question, we have a lot of money in our RIF. How can we avoid excessive taxes on death? So I think as Rutsu touched on there uh, earlier that a RIF account can pass on to a spouse with no tax consequences, but once the second spouse has passed, it all becomes taxable income on the year uh, on the year of death on the final tax return. So, one of the potential so solutions for a tax liability, similar to a, a cottage that we talked about, would be to uh, have a life insurance policy, a permanent policy that you can use to accrue that. Um, tax-free benefit to use for future tax liabilities. Uh, next question. If, if none of my children want the family cottage, should it be sold now while I'm alive? And second question, can joint ownership avoid capital gains? I'll pass those over to Rutsu. Thank you, yeah. So, um... If none of the kids want the cottage, should it be sold now? That's probably a good idea. I mean, it's really a family decision. Um, so if you know that that cottage is not gonna be passed on um, and you no longer want it yourself, it may be a good time to sell. But if you wanna still keep enjoying it for the rest of your life, then you can just simply hold on to it, leave it for the estate, maybe give some instructions to the executor that you expect that this property will be liquidated, will be sold um, when appropriate, so that just the proceeds of sale can be distributed amongst the beneficiaries. Um, but yeah, very, you know, you'll have to really consider what you want for yourself in that situation. And can joint ownership of a cottage avoid capital gains? So there's two ways to do this, one which triggers the capital gain and one which doesn't. So again, if you put your cottage into joint names with a child, if you intend to gift that cottage to your child now, so the child has the full right to use it, full responsibilities respecting it, they're going to also enjoy the increase in the gains on the value of it as, as soon as you gift it to them, then yes, you are disposing of a half interest in that property to your child and you will have to pay capital gains tax when you gift it to them. Um, you could avoid this by actually just transferring uh, a bare trust sort of interest to them. And the, the documents are going to be really crucial here. So you would have to document your intention that you're just adding your child onto the cottage um, for convenience now, um, for avoiding sort of the probate process later down the road. Um, but really that cottage remains yours. You're entirely responsible for it. All of the taxes, et cetera, are yours. So if you document it that way, then you won't trigger the capital gains tax now. It'll be triggered on your death. Um, so again, it's very important to document correctly. Um, otherwise, CRA can come and assess and um, you know, audit and look for those things as well. Um, next question, if I gift cash 
to the next generation, to family members? Will there be taxes that I have to pay or taxes that they have to pay on receiving the gift? Yes, so I can address that one here. So um, if it's just purely cash, um, there's no tax. So there's no gift tax or inheritance tax in Canada. Um, so if it's just cash in a bank account, depending on, you know, if, if it's part of your estate, it might need to go through probate and therefore there's probate tax on it. But otherwise, there's no further tax to be paid by the recipient or um, the owner of that money. Next question, what happens to an RESP in the name of the grandparent on death? This is a great question. Um, what you wanna do, a couple things. One is make sure you name a successor owner. So it could be the parent of the children that are beneficiaries and you can leave it a uh, successor owner so that it passes down to them. Also make sure that uh, when it's addressed in the will that the executor that you've chosen is someone that is aware of this RESP and that the intention is that it is to go to pay for education for the grandkids because it does pass through the will uh, as an RESP. Yes, I think that's something um, that a lot of people aren't aware of, Scott, is that that RESP is not, it doesn't just flow automatically to the named child who it's supposed to benefit. It is an estate asset, so it does get disclosed in a probate application as well. Uh, please comment on co-ownership and capital gains implications. So I think this was referring to property ownership. Ah, okay. So when you co-own a property together, um, you know, it really boils down to what that ownership structure is. So co-owning means you actually own that interest in that property. So if you own a 25% interest in your child's property, 25% of the gains will be taxable to you. That's an investment property for you unless you also reside there as your principal residence. So there will be capital gains taxes on your portion when you dispose of your interest. Okay, final question here, and it's a, it's a big one. <laughs> Please comment on cross-border advice needs for, uh, for listeners who have international holdings uh, or residents of the US or the UK or another country? Yes, <laughs> cross-border issues are complicated. Um, if you have, uh, if you yourself are a US person, you know, US citizen, US resident, or you have family members, beneficiaries that are US people or non-residents, there will be um, unique tax considerations for them. Um, big things are if you're thinking about appointing a non-resident, particularly a U.S. person, as an executor of your will or under a power of attorney, um, I encourage you to think twice. You don't necessarily want to include all of that U.S. tax complication and reporting complications into your life. Um, so just it's it's something that you need to get further advice on if there are cross-border issues in your life thanks rutu and that concludes our session for today hope everyone uh, has something that they can take away and uh you know some advice and encourage you again to think of your own planning and, and seek out some advice on your own for any of the the scenarios that you'd like to discuss uh, and, and get more advice on so uh, lastly, before you disconnect, appreciate if you complete the survey at the bottom of the screen. And as I said, you'll receive a link later with the uh, link to the recording as well as the survey there as well. So thanks again for joining us and hope everyone has a great day.